Hi, I'm Donna Lauren. And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. As we said in our first episode, Donna and I worked on her autobiography for several years until it became a complete manuscript. Donna also has a published personal photos archive book called Pop 60s. Again, she innovates a new, fun way of sharing her life. And now we begin to tell her story in depth in this episode. And don't forget to stick around at the end of our conversation for a live performance from Donna. Before I begin reading chapter one, It Only Hurts When I Cry, of my autobiography, Love's a Secret Weapon, I realize autobiographies are a retrospective of the past. In my storytelling, sure, the stories are from my past, but my perspective stays in the present. So let's begin. On a blistering hot day in July by the Charles River in Boston, my mother was making love in the back seat of her newfound friend Sedan, while the sky exploded with the sound and illumination of fireworks. Robert whispered, I love you, Ruth, as he orgasmed with a gentle sigh. My mother's mixed emotions could not be hidden Fear and ecstasy filled her face, smeared with coral lipstick she always wore. Robert assured her that when she returned to L.A. tomorrow, he would write. Many, many years later, when my mother told me how I was conceived, I was appalled. It's just not information that I could digest easily. I flew her to Hawaii where I was living after Maury, my dad, Ruth's husband of almost 50 years, passed away. We had been estranged for a number of years and this reunion was very revealing. I drove down to Kona, 60 miles from my house in Kohala on the Big Island to meet her. It had been at least seven years since the last time we spoke or saw each other. When I discovered who my biological father was in the mid-90s, I wrote her a letter, and my mother's reply to me was, So what? She had trouble walking toward me as passengers filed off the plane. Her shoulders were rounded, and the glasses she wore were thick bifocals. I could see tears welling up in her eyes, and by the time she reached me, her face was swollen with sadness. My mother's tears of grief spawned tears in me as we embraced. A local man nearby said, Looks like you two ladies are old friends. That's aloha. We checked into the Manalani Resort for one night. I wanted my mother's undivided attention while she told me the story of Robert. I wrote down every word. Her closing remark was, and I still love him. I have been filled with so much shame for most of my life that I honestly didn't know where to begin. So I decided to begin at the beginning. When my mother found out she was pregnant with me, her parents were outraged. They made arrangements for my mother to return to Boston and right the wrong she had created with Robert. Surely she could convince him to make an honest woman out of her and get married. The relative my mother had stayed with previously was my great-aunt Sarah, my maternal grandmother's youngest sister. In fact, Sarah's daughters introduced Robert to my mother. The second time around, not so welcoming. Shame permeated Aunt Sarah's emotions, and she refused to take my mother in. Ruth could not hide her increasingly swollen belly, which made matters worse for those who had issues with unwed mothers. Feeling like an outcast, my mother visited another relative in Boston who happened to be pregnant as well. Her cousin was much more liberal and accepting to my mother, so she found her lodgings for this long, cold winter. 
Soon after, in late October, her cousin became a mother as well. Her daughter, my cousin Natalie, described to me how her mother would put her newborn on my mother's belly to keep the baby inside her warm. Winters in Boston can be brutal. One day, my mother told me she was stepping onto a local train and fell. She landed right on me. She explained that Robert wanted her to get an abortion, which she declined. I feel that subconsciously she attempted to rid herself of this very dark problem in her life by having an accident. Floating around in her embryonic fluids filled with emotions of shame and rejection justified her unconscious action, but my will to live and be born was far greater than her desire to end her misery. And so, on March 7, 1947, I was born. Robert actually showed up at the hospital with flowers. My mother's hope for marriage was renewed. He then asked to see me in the nursery. And when he returned to her room, he firmly said goodbye. My mother fell into a rage, which she took to her grave. Maury came into my mother's life and decided to adopt me. I was 18 months. Another decision was determined not to tell me. The story goes that the judge tore up my original birth certificate and changed the name on it to Zucker, the name Maury used as an artist. It may be only an assumption, but I believe that my mother was in the illusion that Robert, my bio daddy, was going to marry her. So it's fair to say that on the original birth certificate, my last name was Wasserman. Does a judge have that power? I spent 48 and a half years thinking that I got my hair from Maury and God knows what else. All I have to say is lies are dark and heavy. It's the kind of energy you can't trust. Therefore, you never feel safe, damn it. Wow, Donna, that was powerful. Adam, I know that what I've portrayed to everyone, with the exception of my inner circle, is a happy-go-lucky girl. And yes, the essence of who I am is filled with joy. It's interesting you say that because when I asked to interview you going on probably a couple of decades ago, I sent you the questions on email and at the time you were working, um, you had your fashion business, Adasa, and you were on, uh, you were in Hawaii and you responded by email and the responses I got were definitely honest, but perhaps sort of discreet around your family life, your career and so on. And I think I also looked at your answers through the lens of what I believed, you know, the happy go lucky Dr. Pepper Donna or the beach party Donna. So the way that I looked at what you said about those times and your relationship with Maury, your adopted father and, and, um, and your mother, uh, I looked at it in, in the way that many other people do. I kind of saw what was in front of the camera and, and perhaps didn't even you know, speculate about what might have been behind the camera. So I guess what were you feeling um, you know, during that time of your, of your career and your early life? Well, number one... <laughs> was the responsibility. That was the priority. It was drilled into my head that I was the one who was going to be the provider for the family. That was first. I would say underneath my um, personality, Mm -hmm. which was the, you know, the person who loved life, who... um, saw life as beautiful, um, even, even you know, uh, some would say an ugly bug, <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know, and I, I don't know, I would just, I would always look for the beauty in everything as much as possible, but I couldn't share it. Mm. I couldn't share mm. it in the environment that I was in. Um, so I kind of kept that to myself. I think... I was always worried about coming up to 
the standards of what everybody else wanted and be accepted. And I think it's a basic characteristic of abandonment, you know? I felt like I needed to sacrifice any boundaries to give everyone around me, my family, mostly my parents, the people I worked for, any third party, I would acquiesce my power to theirs so that I, you know, I wouldn't be rejected or abandoned. I think that's mm. kind of what it came down to. And the irony, Adam, mm. the irony is that the person who really physically, as most people would say, abandoned me. Yeah. Was was the father that I never knew or, you know, never met and um, never had any contact with except for that one moment of eye contact mm. when he saw me right after I was born. Something very important, very deep happened in that moment because I have never had a bitter thought about him. I've never felt resentment since I found out. And it's been about 25 years. Maybe it's because when I got together with my mother that um, that when she said that he, he had a beautiful voice mm. and, mm. and he loved music, um, I, I have to say that sometimes I feel his spirit um, and I feel his um, c- conflict of, you know, of being in a culture that couldn't accept, uh, you know, a child out of wedlock. And, you know, being from a very conservative environment, you know, Mm. Boston, I would say, is one of the most conservative in this country, for sure, in the United States. Um, Maybe not anymore, but... (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. You know. (laughs) I don't know how it is. 73, yeah, 73 years ago, for sure. And certainly, um, I was just going to, you know, just going to say that in preparation for us talking today... I sort of started, I, I sort of went down the rabbit hole a little bit and, and looking at sort of the pervading, what the sort of social ideas around wedlock and so on were at that time. And I, I found some sort of old stuff from the 40s and 50s. And, and it's really eye-opening now because of where we are to see what it was like back then and just how much taboo, how much stigma there was, um, you know, towards, towards what had happened um, to your mother and Robert at that time. Yes, yes, and no. Mm. Mm. And I, I tend to go to an example mm. uh, because I read about uh, Carla Bruni, who was the wife of the president of France, mm, of or Cozy at mm. one point. And of course, she's an artist of, in her own rights and a model, you know, but she was born out of, um, well, her mother had an affair while she was married. Yeah, yeah. So the circumstances were uh, different mm. a bit, but but the mother, you know, the mother's feelings toward this life was one of an embrace, mm. Mm. and so she um, included this new little one into her family that already existed, and they too embraced this new little life. Mm. So, you know, it's very circumstantial, and I think it goes back to the beginning, you know, of of life on Earth. Oh, we are going back to the beginning. It's about relationships Mm. and karma and um, chemistry, alchemy, um, destiny, your fate, uh, what we all came in to learn and, you know, what our lessons are. So um, I think. Gosh, if if I were to get a little analytical, mm. I would say with you, I think my mom came in to have the experience that was very bitter. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's why I said she took it to her grave because, you know, she just wasn't a happy woman. She too, she had a kind of um, facade about her. Mm. I'm saying she too, because I'm including myself, my, um, the, the personality I portrayed wasn't a facade. It Mm. was actually the other side of me. Mm. And it's the side that I think was the true me. You know, I think that 
what I came into to um, learn, you know, was a, a very fearful kind of lesson. So I had to be extremely careful and, um, and not include it in, let's say, the success of being a person on planet Earth and having friendships and any kind of relationships and any kind of success. It's interesting you say that because I know you've said this to me before and I know you've said it in interviews and I know it does come up in our manuscript and we will talk about it somewhere down the line as well. But you did talk about this idea that what was going on at home and, and this sort of tension that was always at home, and I do want to talk a little bit more about that, but that sort of tension and, and so on that was there, that when you were in front of the camera, when when you were on um, you know Shindig, for example, and the camera light would go on, something else kicked in that sort of other side of you that's the side that you know some people might say well that was the you know the the public facade but as you're saying it wasn't but something kicked in in terms of this joy within you to want to bring joy to people through singing to them yeah i um i've thought about it a lot and i think what we all want in life is safety Mm. and love Mm. um but when the camera even when my adopted dad was taking photographs of me or I was in a studio working with a microphone, somehow I bypassed whatever, um, oh gosh, I don't want to say oppression, Mm. but (laughs) you know, a a feeling of not being safe with the people that I was around um, with a few exceptions, but um, generally speaking and that clicked off when I had the opportunity to to look in a camera. I, I kind of bypassed the, um, you know, what was physically surrounding me yeah. at the moment that would create any fear. Mm. I I just bypassed that. I went straight to communicating and connecting with those, you know, other souls on the other mm. side that. Mm that would, um, you know, would be, would be in harmony with me. And fortunately, that worked. Yeah, and it did. And and the proof is in, you know, the pudding when we watch those old tapes of Shindig, you know, many of them are on YouTube and so on. You know, we see that you, you, you can, you're communicating with that audience and sort of showing that, that what you call that, you know, that joy or that other side of you. And, it's interesting when you were when you were talking about the idea of safety and so on. I think that's probably a really important point because I know there's a lot of research in developmental psychology and it talks about what we call attachment to, to parents and attachment to caregivers. And we know that, you know, attachment styles, um, the way that we relate to other people, you know, emerge in our infancy, our early childhood, where the types of bonds with our caregivers that we have at that early stage and caregivers traditionally mother, father and so on, they lead us to develop what we call or what they call in psychology internal working models regarding our relationships with others. So from those relationships, we, um, you know, we form these ideas about can we depend on other people? Do other people make us feel safe? Can they be that safe base from which we, you know, explore the world, whether we're worthy of people's attention and love and and so on. And I think I was reading some research from um, some researcher, Judith Feeney, and some other um, people that she works with on adoption. Now, your situation is probably quite unique in that a lot of the research from that time talks about um, people who were uh, born to unwed mothers and taken away, and they find out later they're adopted, whereas yours was you know, quite different in that your your mother did not adopt you out. She was your, your mother, but you know, Maury came on the scene and and um, you were led to believe that he was your biological father. But mm-hmm. regardless of that, I guess what that sort of research um, says that, you know, adoptees or, or people who perhaps don't know their parents often have that feeling of loss and, and difficulty with a sense of self, particularly when they become aware of, um, you know, the adoption, which for many people would be much later, particularly those who were adopted out in the, you know, sort of early mid-century. So, you know, Mm. what I think is interesting is this idea that even though you didn't know until much later, until you were, you know, in your, uh, I I guess it was in the, the 1990s that you found out, you always felt that you didn't quite belong um, or that sense of rejection or abandonment and being unsure of your identity during that time? Well, all of that that you just discussed is, um, is very interesting. And um, 
it yes it it just goes to show how um dysfunctional our culture mm. has been how much how much we need not just in this country and that i live in but all over the world just the mentality of inclusion rather than exclusion mm. and uh, where you belong how you belong because we all belong mm. to this one big family called planet earth Mm, and mm. you know we are all part of the dna of every life form but yes i certainly did not feel that you know when it even came to my appearance i Mm. didn't think that i belonged but um the way i was treated you know i i was i was kind of um i was obviously given uh, a home yeah i was you know cared for in a certain way but um and interestingly enough mm, both parents treated me very differently in what way um, in what way well i don't believe that either my brothers or my adopted dad Mm. um ever really knew the depth of of my mother's feelings toward me yeah yeah um because you know they she, i think she was able to want their love and maybe have a chemistry with them that she totally didn't have with me yeah yeah um and but she was able to shoot me those glances and you know find ways of showing me her contempt right and you know keep me you know on guard and you know and um i I, i've been told by by my medical practitioner that there's a part of the brain the called the amygdala Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep that deals with your um fight and flight Mm -hmm. and um and Really, until recently, uh, I would say in the last few years, and actually even during this pandemic, it's even come to into more light that um, that the fight or flight uh, has been on. It's been, yeah. on, you know, what what normally happens, uh, uh, you know, apparently, is that, and you can speak to this more authentically. That in the amygdala, you know, you have a, a relationship with the adrenal gland, the adrenaline and your brain stem. And it it tells you when danger comes to act. Mm. But when the fight or flight is always on, you're always watching your back. Absolutely. So mm. I remember, you know, as a child, you know, I, I really couldn't sleep. And, yeah. you know, I was always on edge. And I guess when you're young, you know, you can rest. Well, I wasn't really resting. No, but you, had, looked, you had quite you a know. schedule at the, in those days. Yeah, I was kind of put away, you know, so that I, I had, I looked like I was resting or sleeping. Mm. But mm. I really, I, I really never did until I changed my environment. And that was much later on. Yeah. But, um but uh, these are all life lessons, and this sense of belonging, seriously, um, you know, it's it. You come into the world, um, and we all have these expectations, you know, that mother should be this way and father should be that way, and you know, and and I've known people that have been adopted and they never meet their mm. um, biological parents. And the people that have adopted them are so loving and warm and giving that they wouldn't have traded that for the world. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's um, so. And I was just going to say, as you're saying that, I think that's that's a really important issue that we've I know we've spoken about before, because you know when we were talking a lot about that idea that um, they might they might feel that 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 sense of loss and so on. What we also know from the research is it's really about those relationships they do have with those caregivers, the adopted caregivers, that if they are good and satisfying relationships, 
then the outcomes are, you know, it, you know, pretty much the same as someone who is with their biological parents. So it does come down to how do how do those relationships play out? Not the fact that someone's necessarily adopted or anything like that, but how is that that warmth and and safety sort of provided by whoever the caregiver, you know, is? Yes, and you know, and also, how many people all over this planet? you know, come into a family and, um, and leave their family at some point because, Mm -hmm. or their family leaves them, but, you know, let's just use the example of them leaving their family at a probably quite an early age, seeking an environment that, you know, does, uh, embrace them and does make them feel wanted and does make them feel a sense of value. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and how many of us all over the planet, uh, you know, almost 8 billion of us, um, have this uh, ideal situation, which I applaud, you know, where you come into a, a mother and father who love you and adore you and, you know, and, and listen and um, really listen, you know, mm-hmm. listen to you and, um, and get to know who you are. <laughs> because they give you that time and space. Mm, but mm. how many of us, you know, go out and create a surrogate family um, to, you know, belong and mm. to, to have this sense of, you know, this is who I am. I'm accepted and I have value in, in this particular, you know, surrogate family. So it's so true. You know, it's that- so true what you're saying, isn't it? That I think so much you know, so much can sometimes be driven by the the personal distress that, you know, in this case, we're talking about a caregiver, a parent, you know, that personal distress, their their own sort of what's going on with them and how they, how they then respond to their child in that way. And, and, you know, so often people need to go out and, and sort of find those other attachment figures, those people they can feel safe with, those people they can bond with. And I'm interested, um, you know, to, to sort of ask you that because, we you know, uh, obviously, you know, attachment figures or, or people that we bond with and we feel secure to can be people that come much later on in our lives. And I know you've spoken to me mm-hmm. before about when you were, you know, quite young, there was there was a grandfather, for example, but also I would say probably, um, you know, someone who I think provided that sort of safety to you would, of course, be your, your husband, Jared. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And who knows when that all started? I mean, if you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that that's kind of you know predestined or or something mm-hmm. because you know it's 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 relationships with the heart. Yeah. And um um you know it, so many well so many relationships are especially when you're young, um, you know the curiosity kind of like gets to you and you want mm-hmm. and you want to know about people that aren't like you yeah. and um yeah. you know when you're entering into different relationships or friendships but at at this time in my life fortunately I even though we've known each other forever um to actually settle down and and make a life together mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. we 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 bonded over um this wonderful heart connection which really is based on safety yeah and um it it, you know you can be ugly you can show you're ugly you can you can you can be all who you are and not be judged and um and be uh listened to you know if you haven't been listened to by uh let's say parents um someone comes along you know if you're fortunate enough to take the time and listen and for 25 years you know Mm. i've had the good fortune of having that sort of person in my life and i'm so so grateful and it's like a miracle to me absolutely (laughs) and and he really is my secret weapon so (laughs) i love that i love that (laughs) you know i'll call i'll call my husband jared my secret weapon you've already given have you given up the, the the podcast clue? I don't know that what our title is. No, that's not. That's that's just part <laughs> of it, of course. But it's interesting. Yes. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking about as you were sort of saying that that idea that, of course, you know, we get so much of our 
um, you know, love and security and, and feeling heard from, from people in our lives. But when you were talking about that idea of, you know, the opposite of that, that sort of flight or fight response where some people are just in this constant looking for danger and never feeling safe. And, and I would say that probably the antithesis, and I'm lucky I got that word out, I'm being very brave. Yeah, that was wonderful. <laughs> something like that. Um, but, you know, the kind of the opposite of that flight or, or fight is also you know, compassion and compassion from others, but also compassion to yourself. And, and I guess I'm interested in how, how you've learnt, you know, from, from what you've experienced, um, and we're talking about, you know, the early days from there, but, you know, from now, how do you sort of show kindness or develop kindness, you know, for yourself, um, you know, and that self-compassion, which allows us to, to be open to experience rather than, I guess, that flight or fight and always running from danger? That's probably a, a, a hard question. Um, yes, yes. Well, of course, because it takes a lot of introspection. And, um, and what I really believe is I never really stay in the five senses awareness Mm-hmm. Um, where I feel like I have to prove something by seeing it, touching it, hearing yeah. it, tasting it, smelling it. Of course, I love the five senses. I, you know, I love the <laughs> aroma of a freshly baked pie and the sight of a rose or you know, one of a newborn baby. Or the wildlife um, that you that you have around. I know yes, where you live at the moment. You're you're sort of inundated Indeed. with wildlife. Mm-hmm. The deer and. Mm. <laughs> um, but I really think that what gives me that insight, Adam, is um, is knowing that, well, space has energy. All the space around us has energy. And what is out there and my connection with the source, um, you know, I'm, I would say I'm not a religious person. But if I would say I have one religion, I would call it love. Mm. And I really do feel, and I have since I was a very little girl on my own, that this incredible um, relationship with, with the source, with, with the light, with, with the, um, the, the things that, that, that you don't really feel comfortable sharing with a lot of people because Mm. they might say you're crazy Mm. or, you you know, they wouldn't believe you or they might turn it into something else. Um, But I've that I came in with it. I've felt it. Um, I think other people have drawn on it. I think I Mm. have in my, in my, you know, in my uh, inability to, understand myself well enough Mm. i've given it away many times yeah and um and i'm learning and i i'm learning and and i'm just so grateful that uh some you know even even though i've lived a long life already you know that the wisdom that you come in with is nurtured and um you know cultivated into a kind of your mo you know your modus operandi mm-hmm. and um you know it helps you navigate through life um because you know if you are of that type that gives your power away because yeah, you feel yeah. that threat of abandonment and that self-sacrifice then, you know, that comes from that that's that's right and you when yeah and i mean there's actually a, a term called blood donor if you become a blood donor to vampires. Yep. So <laughs> I was wondering where that was going to go, and that makes perfect sense. Um, but if you, even if, if you have the consciousness that you have an energy that someone else wants and they have somehow lured you into giving it to them, you st- I still... I don't know about everyone because mm. I'm not, every, you know, I can only be me, but I have always had some awareness that, that that was happening, right. even though what was happening was extremely destructive, extremely mm. uncomfortable and required a lot of recovery. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but I do believe that when you go beyond what we can see, touch, feel, hear, and smell, that if you go beyond that, that um, that it just gives you it gives you a, a, a different connection with life, and um, and and it really helps you survive. It's um I'm reminded of, and this is a book that you recommended to me a, a while back called. Uh, now Descartes Tolle, it's a, is it a good earth? Uh, no, it's not a good, a new earth, a new earth. That's the one. Yes. And he talks yes. a little bit about this idea. And, and this is, you know, we see this in all sorts of, you know, therapy and, and all sorts of things, this idea that we're often really in, so enmeshed in what our thoughts are, what we can see, what we can hear and what we can, um, you, you know, what we're thinking, that voice in our head. But he sort of talks to that idea that we're not actually, you know, that voice in our head with all that, um, rumination and negativity and self-criticism and doubt and all of that, we are able to actually step back and look at those thoughts and see them, you know, often for what they are, which is just our sort of flight or fight response kicking in rather than something we need to be aware of or pay attention to. But the fact that we can sort of step back and look at that stuff suggests that there's something else when we're not just our thoughts and, and what sort of goes on in our head, but there's something else beyond that. And, you know, whatever you want to call that, some people might say it's some sort of spirituality soul, you know, in psychology, it'd probably be, you know, the, the ability to reflect on yourself. But yeah, there's interesting that we're not just what we're thinking all the time. Yes. And the thinking you, is what is referred to as the ego, and, you know, um, ego to me is, uh, you know, a healthy ego tells you when, when, you know, when you fall down to pick yourself up mm, or, mm. you know, when there's, you know, um, or to have, um, to have a, a sense of, um, a good judgment, you yeah. know, in terms of your own safety, um, and you can expand on that, but, um, ego, when you think that you're, you know, you're in control, mm. you know, I've read a lot about surrender and that is, that is when you tap into the source and lots of people have different names for it, whatever it is, you know, it's a heck of a lot more powerful than just little old me mm. and given little old you. Yeah. I mean, what's going on in the world at the moment? I think such a you know, a good example of the idea that, you know, for the most part, many of us, and I'm, I'm generalizing because, you know, not everyone has, you know, so much control over their daily, what they can do and, and so on. But, you know, for those of us who feel that we're generally quite in control of our lives, something like what's going on so much in the world with so much unrest and turmoil and everything else makes us realize that we're not in control of everything all the time. And what you talk about that surrender and being, you know, being willing to surrender sometimes to that uncertainty and that unknownness and, and, you know, rather than trying to always be in control is something that's really, really difficult, but something that I think, you know, really goes to that heart of that idea of, of what surrender is and moving away from the ego. Yeah, it requires faith, you know, mm. To, mm. To, look up, to look up in the heavens and to know that, you know, we down here, you know, are just little creatures that are very humble. And um, and when we get too big for our britches, <laughs> you know, we get in trouble. Yeah. We, it's, it happens every single time. That's yeah. the dilemma. Yeah. And it's been going on for way too long. And um, the idea of, you know, that we are of, you know, of the same DNA. Mm -hmm. We are all one uh, philosophy. Um and that there is a, a source of, of energy, of a life f a force, um, that <laughs> it's, it's um, for me, I mean, it may be scary to surrender in the beginning, but, but when, when I turn my palms up to the heavens, and I've seen this in many, many paintings and religious mm -hmm. paintings, as a matter of fact, where, where the exchange of light comes from the human, you know, out into the universe. And it's basically recycled. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, when, it's when the truth happens. It's when love happens. And, um, and it's, it's when, 
you know, you see, you see your brother and your sister as one and you see all life as one. You feel their beating hearts, you know, <laughs> today mm. I was watering mm. uh, a plant. I was watering a citronella plant, which mm. is like from the geranium family and uh, out comes a praying mantis. Mm. Mm. Didn't like me squirting water <laughs> on him. <laughs> And that praying mantis was so different. Most praying mantis I've ever seen are all green. Yeah, yeah, most of them are. You know, or like like Kermit the Frog. <laughs> <laughs> and this one was speckled. And I was so intrigued. And I started talking to the little guy. You know, it's like, sorry, sorry, I squirted you. You know, I'll back <laughs> off. I didn't know you were there. I love you know? it. And Jared's just looking through the you... window going, oh, she's speaking to the mantises again. Okay, cool. <laughs> Well, and and there you go in a relationship like like I have mm, with Jared. Mm. That's you know non judgmental. You know it might be humorous, mm. but he's 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 not accusing me of anything. No, he, no, because we feel you know we feel the energy in in the trees, and we feel the and and it's good. It's like that old thing of stopping to smell the roses, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. but. But I tell you, the wisdom part is before you stick your nose in the rose, you better check to see if there's a <laughs> bee in there. <laughs> I love that. That's so good. <laughs> and on that note, mm, my love, mm. I think that we have gone so deep. We're almost hitting the core of the earth, for goodness sake. And it's so <laughs> wonderful to be able to discuss things with you so deeply and beautifully. And um, I just, I just love that that our podcast is giving us this opportunity. Absolutely, I agree. And and I was I was going to say, you know, just as I as we were talking, I've got you know my my little cavoodle Lucy is sort of sleeping on my lap. She's under a blanket. <laughs> you've got the summer over there in Australia. We've got the the winter. And um, I I don't know. Maybe people can tell us um, when you're listening. You might if you hear something slightly in the background, it might just be her contentedly snoring. So I just want to <laughs> preface that if you do hear it, that's that's, that's Lucy wonderful. There. Um, but it's <laughs> well, been sweet little mm. Lucy. <laughs> And I, I'll have to, we'll share some photos on, on, you know, social media or something, but um, it's been so great to talk to you as always again. And, and um, I, I guess it's just, you know, until next time. Yes. And I would love to end this episode mm. with a song that I wrote. Uh, I think it's relevant for the times and uh, until we meet again, adieu. See you later.
Thanks for listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast with Donna Lauren and me, Dr. Adam Girachi. You just heard Only Love, written by Donna and performed live here for you. Only Love appears on Donna's album, Love It Away, available at DonnaLauren.net. Join us next time as we blaze a trail presenting for you a multi-sensory audio autobiography through storytelling. And remember to follow us on your favourite podcast platform. Yes, love.